So let's go ahead and read our scripture today. Uh, this is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Just listen to these words. This is, this is uh, Jesus speaking. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be uh, thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Well, I'm Chris Bryant, the senior pastor here, and um, I want to invite you just for a moment to imagine if somebody was sharing with you these words, um, either in letter or perhaps they were saying it to you in person. Just imagine that with me, somebody saying this to you. When we met, I began to discover in you a new vulnerability, a warmth and a lack of pretense that impressed me. I saw in you a thriving spirit, no signs of in internal stagnation. I could tell you were a growing person, and I liked that. I saw you had strong self-esteem, but it wasn't based on the, full, on the fluff of uh, self-help books or pop psychology, but on something deeper, a whole lot deeper. I, I saw that you lived uh, by convictions and priorities and not by convenience or financial gain, and I've never been anybody like that before. I felt a depth of love and concern as you listened to me and you didn't judge me. You tried to understand me, you sympathized and celebrated with me, and you demonstrated kindness and generosity. And not just to me, you, you've done that to others as well, I've seen that. And as you stood for things, you did so with gentleness and with integrity. You presented to me something deep and profound, and for those reasons and a whole host of others, I found myself really wanting what you had. Now that I've become a Christian, I wanted to tell you I'm grateful beyond words for how you demonstrated to me what it really means to follow him. So we have been uh, in, the, in the midst of these series of sermons this year um, that I've been asking, inviting, encouraging folks to take the opportunity in, in a year of 2020 to use that uh, wonderful irony or pun to ask God to open the eyes of our heart open the guys of our mind and, and help us see more fully, more clearly, to be seen better ourselves. And in the midst of that, we've had various kinds of sermon topics, and, and, and this is part two of kind of a mini-series called Human Bibles, what it means to witness to our faith. What does it mean that, that other people could read us, and in reading us, they see Jesus? And so that's where we are today. And, and the scripture that I read today uh, I read to you are the three metaphors that Jesus used to describe his church, his movement, those that would be his followers. He, he calls them salt of the earth and light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And, and that's where I want us to go today. And as I do that, I will share with you, first and foremost, that I believe in the church. I believe in the body of Christ. And, and this is something that is incredibly important for evangelism in the 21st century. The question that is asked or will be asked is not whether or not people believe in God. They can more or less buy into God, maybe. But what they're pretty sure that they don't want is church. I believe in the church. I believe in the body of Christ. And I think that Christians have to recapture the New Testament understanding of what church actually is. To save it, to save our faith from being hijacked from a privatized, individualized, consumeristic understanding of the gospel that actually doesn't stand a chance to transform anybody's life, let alone the world. Hear me. The church is the plan. There's no backup plan. The church is the plan. <laughs> There's no backup plan. May we discover what Jesus intends for the church to be and allow ourselves to be part of that, surrendering ourselves to what his intentions are. And here in Matthew chapter 5, we see it described in these powerful metaphors, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, a city set on a hill. 
a, a definitive understanding. What he wants us to do is understand exactly what his movement would be like. The, the nature, the characteristics, the actions of the people who would bear his name. Remember from the sermon last week, those of you that were here, not to take the name in vain, right? That commandment, most of us just assign that to swearing when in fact, no, we're being identified with the very mission of God. God's mission has always been the same, to have a particular special relationship with a group and through that relationship with that group, reveal God's self to the entire world. That's always been the mission. So don't take the name in vain. Jesus is describing here and saying the soul of the earth and the light of the world, a city center on the hill. Dis distinct and deliberate caricatures of what the actions and nature and character of people who bear his name, people who are filled with his spirit, they will be like salt of the earth, light of the world, city on a hill. And I believe he was describing it in such a way so as to imply that his followers would not just have a message about him, but his followers would themselves be the message. They would share the message, and part of in sharing the message was them, their own lives would reflect the very message that they were describing. The idea of salt and light sitting on a hill means that Jesus' followers would exemplify, they, they would demonstrate, they would model the way of Jesus. They would model the way. People would unalterably know Jesus. They would see Jesus by virtue of being with Jesus' followers. Now, that's good. I'm all, I, I tell traditional folks at this point, I say, yes, that's, that's a place for an amen. We're in contemporary, so I'll lead you a little bit. The plan is that Jesus' followers in sharing the message would be part of the message so much so that people who are not familiar or not part of the body of Christ would know who Jesus is, would feel Jesus, feel they've seen Jesus by virtue of being with Jesus' followers. Amen. That's the plan. There is no backup plan. That's called the church. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. This is not a condemnation to be perfect and no less than perfect, although biblical scholars will note that only a few verses after Jesus says these wonderful things, he, and in fact, does say, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, okay? But we also know from uh, John Wesley and others who helped us understand that passage that, that perhaps what the Lord is in fact meaning there is perfection in love that is entirely possible by the power of his Holy Spirit that our heart would be filled with nothing but love of God and love of neighbor, that that's entirely possible. And so that is what is meant by in, in the sense of, of perhaps be perfect because your heavenly father is perfect. Not, not that we are to be perfect in the stoic, stuffy, inhumane way that, that often people describe pretentious religious people. No, instead Jesus is using salt and light and a city on a hill, these wonderful method, messages to describe that, that when we would share the message of him, we would be sharing more than the story about him, that our own lives would be part of what we're sharing. Every time a Jesus follower would share something about Jesus, the idea is that that person would feel the realness in the story. The person would feel the realness in the actions of that. They would feel the embodiment of that story. There would be some, some sense of credibility in the fact that this person is telling me this. And even as they're telling me these incredible things, I sense within them the truth of it. Because at least in them, it's work. It's worked. It's working. Jesus never once says or even hints that we are to argue people into his movement. Never once does he suggest that we should argue people into believing him. But over and over we read of how his disciples would nevertheless stand out. We read it in the Gospels as Jesus teaches and leads. We, we pick it up in the, new, the rest of the New Testament as, as the, Paul and others work with that early church. We certainly see it in church history that what makes them stand out was their character, their kindness, their gentleness, their, their ability to rise above what could be expected in human beings in this world and somehow be attached to something more than this world by virtue of how they dealt with the now that was different than others. I love this. 
Let me put it in another way that's maybe a bit more personal. Understanding Jesus' words of that his followers would be salt of the earth and light of the world, city on a hill, in a very personal meaning means whatever is happening here on Sunday morning, whatever is happening here on Wednesday nights, whatever is happening here any other day of the week where we gather is not, in fact, the finish line, but the starting line. That's the intent. It's not that we do everything we can to just barely get here, even though sometimes that's the way it is, and that's just practical. I get that. But ideologically, spiritually, no, no, this is where we begin. Everything starts here. This is, this is where everything happens. And what's interesting is that churches that get this, not just kind of in an academic way, but churches that understand this innately, like it becomes part of their DNA, it's ironic. The churches that are, that are more concerned with, with the sending out of people tend to do a lot better at the gathering in of people as opposed to the churches that are only concerned with gathering in and who's here. And Well, then they don't tend to do as well. It's ironic, isn't it? The folks in the churches that seem to get us and the command to go tend to do better with people come. <laughs> I love salt and light, the city on the hill. It defines success, not in terms of how many actually showed up, but in terms of how many will leave today determined to love and serve God. How many leave today filled with the power of the Holy Spirit? How many people leave determined today to not just come to church, but to go and be the church of Jesus Christ? This is the plan. There's no backup plan. <laughs> and so, again on a very personal way, even more personal than what I just shared. In an individual way, we might say. This means that whatever you are gaining here, and I hope you are, I hope whatever inspiration you find in the time of worship, the closeness that you might find in times of prayer, the affection, just the warmth that you might get by someone else greeting you or saying hi or welcoming you, or the friendships that are here in the renew, whatever, or maybe the hearing of a good sermon, I hope. You know, all those wonderful things, listen, isn't just for you. It's for you then to go and be empowered and be emboldened to be the church with one another, us together, in the world. As salt and light as a city on a hill, God's mission is to save the whole world, including you, and then include you in the saving of the whole world. What's interesting is that the first Christians didn't propose to turn the first century world upside down. They just did it. See, that wasn't a goal, it wasn't a strategy meeting, it wasn't a marketing session. You know, not, to, not that any of those things are bad, because sometimes we need to do them. But lest we forget, the most fun, fun, foundational thing is the fact that they were just who they were. And how their lives were being conformed to the one they'd given their life to. No plan of action, no strategy, strategy session can ever come close can ever replace the most elemental truth that the mission of Jesus Christ is changed lives in Jesus determined by his spirit to change lives. Nothing can replace it. I mean, again, not that anything else, we need to strategize. I'm all for a marketing campaign. We're working on outdoor signage right now. It's important. But it can't replace the fundamental mission. That's just, that's just icing. The meat of the matter is changed lives in Jesus, reaching out to change the lives of others and inviting others to be part of that world-changing movement, which is the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of God, inaugurated in the body, death, resurrection of Christ. True outreach begins with genuine relationships, genuine discipleship. Otherwise, we're just talking about numbers, Right? I mean, I love to talk about numbers, but unless we're actually thinking about souls and people, then it's just, it's just some other, it's just like any other organization. Eugene Peterson, who's a, um, has passed away now, Eugene uh, was the author of the uh, message version of the, the Bible, the paraphrase version, good Presbyterian brother and pastor. Uh, he writes this in one of his books. He says, you know, some of the church growth in Nor North America is more like a tumor than actual growth in the body of Christ. 
He says, you know, tumors are those things that the that, that, that cells, that, that they forget what they're supposed to be. And they start living to themselves. And they just grow by taking up more and more and more resources. And ultimately, they hurt the overall body. Now, that was a strong statement by Eugene, and I get what he's saying, and it's interesting. And I think I, I, I've been around those, those kind of environments. But, and, and the importance for us to, to understand the mission at hand. But I'll also say this, just kind of as on the side. Eugene, as much as it is for, for me, I, I have this strange relationship with Eugene Peterson where I both love and I'm and, and frustrated at times by some of what he's written because I disagree. And, but I find hard, my hard time proving that I'm right. <laughs> and the thing is, I'm better in my own walk with Christ because I'm allowing myself to interact with that person who is also following Christ and that's somehow through that interaction, the saltiness and the, the brightness and the city on a hill that can't be hidden works. And I'm propelled in my own relationship with Christ. And I, I say that because sometimes we get to thinking that only, only when we're all like exactly the same is this going to work. And that's not true. I've been here for 20 months. Surely I've said something that you disagree with. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Come on. I, the, some, of the, some of the greatest supporters of people in my life uh, have been people that at some point in time came to me and said, Chris, I just, I don't think I, we see eye to eye at all about this. I, I was uh, reflecting this morning uh, um, in the shower, you know, in some prayer time, and, and uh, as I was thinking about the sermon, it, it, the thought came to me, one particular person in mind uh, was this guy, it means the world to me. He was so there for me in one of the greatest, I mean, just one of the most terrible times in my life. He was one of my closest people. And he and I fundamentally disagreed about something years prior. It wasn't necessarily theological. It was very practical. But I just could not, at the time, I could not see where he was coming from. And it wasn't because I didn't care about the guy. I, did. I just, I could not, I just... Fast forward years and pain and, and growth and seeing things differently from different angles, and all of a sudden I got it. But it doesn't change the fact that there's no way I could have got it until I did. Which means part of our saltiness and brightness that we're supposed to have is an attitude and a peace and a gentleness, recognizing that maybe we won't get it until we do. Or maybe they won't get it until they do. And how we act until that moment is just as important. Does that make sense? I hope so. It's part of this message of salt and light in a city on a hill. God is intent, sisters and brothers, on our reaching a place of maturity where we will be constantly carrying Jesus' life through ours to a world that is dying for an example of his presence and his love great pastor and church planter by the name of uh, Steve Shogren said that. Sometimes we Christians talk about mission as if it's like in a box. We're going to go do mission. Here's the mission. <laughs> I mean, we really don't think like that, but sometimes that's the way we act. And the, and, and the thing is, we have to understand that mission is never, ever, ever disconnected from us. It's, it's always, no matter what else we do, Ultimately, all that we're offering is our own relationship with Jesus. I could talk to you about the credentialing I have, whether it's my you know, degree in religion and philosophy, my undergraduate degree, or my undergraduate degree in psychology or sociology. I could talk to you about my master's degree. You know what? You have credentials. There's all sorts of amazing credentials in this church. And they're, they're, it's great. <laughs> this wonderful thing, very helpful. But it doesn't matter at the end, unless we understand that all we're really going to offer anyone as far as mission is concerned is our own walk with the Lord. Mission can never be displaced from our own personal relationship, from the mission that's in us, the, the embodiment of the gospel. When Jesus says salt of the earth, 
When he says, you're the salt of the earth, you know, salt is something that transforms the physical properties of that which it touches. Salt brings out the goodness in food. No amen on that either? Wow. Wow, tough group. Um, it's used as a preservative that keeps food from spoiling, and that's not just an old kind of years gone by thing. Like, no, actually just pick up a box of almost anything or a can of almost anything. It's loaded with sodium. Still to this day, it's used as a preservative. Um, salt has certain healing properties. It is in some ways essential for life. Certainly Jesus had all this in mind when he uh, describes his, his followers and challenged us and commissioned us as salt of the earth. He intrinsic, intrinsically knew that people who had a generation, genuine relationship with God through him would by nature, being filled with his spirit, transform the culture around them. That their goodness would keep the world from going all the way bad. That their presence would be healing and to some extent ex essential for the lives of others. I think Jesus meant all this and more when he said, you're the salt of the earth. And when he calls us the light of the world, nothing is more important than light when you're surrounded by darkness. A flashlight is the most important tool to illuminate your path through the woods on the dark night if, nothing, if you have nothing else there, if there's no other light. What an important safety tool. What an emotionally benefit as well, not only physical but emotional, because you can see your way clearly in the dark. How critical it is to have a flashlight on you if your car breaks down in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. Other than a cell phone, I'd like to have a flashlight. Light shows us the potential pitfalls all along the way and gives us the ability to keep moving forward without fear. When we consider the power of a light, when we think of a lighthouse on the ocean shore, which offers guidance and a warning to keep ships from certain peril, or even something as simple as a nightlight, how pitiful, tiny little lights they are. And yet with each of my three sons, how necessary it was to make sure that that light was plugged in and a child that otherwise might be a bit jittery or nervous is calm and relaxed. I think Jesus meant all of this when he says, you're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. He meant this and more. And, and, and when Jesus calls us a city on a hill, there were several cities at the time that were called cities on the hill. And, and, and what they have in common is that they were incredibly obvious to everyone. Literally, you can't hide it. People used these uh, well-known famous cities that were essentially landmarks. People would use them for orientation and direction. You could point to it no matter where you thought you were or where you needed to go. If you could see it, then you could find your way home. 89% of us, or 89% of our learning, I should say, for most of us, primarily comes through visual learning. And if you doubt this, right, what, just, just think, when's the last time you needed to fix something? Did you actually look at the directions or did you go to YouTube? You went to YouTube. And those of you that haven't experienced this, check it out. It'll be an addiction. <laughs> because you're like, oh, wow, now I see. Because I could have read that six times and not, oh, that's okay. We learn best visually. Faith is always more caught than taught. I mean, I could give you some of the best sermons, and I try. But what really makes them stick is not what you feel right now, but when you go to actually apply it to your life, and in particular, if you see someone else practicing it. If you see a Sunday school teacher practice it, or a Sunday school a person in Sunday, or your small group, or, or somebody you're, you're connected with, if they go to actually live something out, boy, it really, you're like, that's, yeah. All of a sudden, something that inspired you here becomes real there. I am absolutely convinced that people need real flesh and blood examples of people following Jesus, doing what he said to do, becoming what he wants us to be, living our lives in a manner that he would live them if he were us. Programs don't make disciples of Jesus. Worship doesn't make disciples of Jesus. Sermons, like now questioning my job here, but sermons do not make disciples of Jesus. Only disciples make disciples of Jesus. It's through relationships. 
through relationship. The staff and I, we went to, um, we went to a uh, um, seminar on discipleship a, a few months after I got here, and it was really important. We, there was a lot of great things that we learned out of that, but, but one thing that we all took away, it was near the end of the seminar, where the speaker got up and, and he said, you know, we've said a lot of great stuff, but, but, it, but here's the one thing that everybody needs to take away. The churches that figure out discipleship, however you choose to do it, because it's more complicated now than ever. The churches that figure out, basically, they understand this. That people want to come, they, they, you know, they, they, want, they, they, they come wanting to be fed. And that's great. But just how many high chairs can you have in your church? Before you start asking people, how about you come up and help feed these others? You see that? Because there's a limit, isn't there? There's a limit. We can say, we can say all we want, that we want all sorts of people here. And we, might, we really, may really mean that. But the truth is, we can only do so much until we realize, well, we, we at least need to start feeding each other. <laughs> people have this misunderstanding that it's almost like, like we wait to graduate some. And, and, and have you ever went to a Christian graduation? Oh, you're now fully a Christian. Here's your piece of paper, right? That, that just doesn't happen. And it's almost like we, we wait for that or, or someone to tell us, give us permission or I, I don't, it's, it's kind of strange. I, I've even dr- drawn it out before. It's like, here's the basic path, you know, seeker, believer, disciple, disciple maker. And, and for certain practicality, something like that can be helpful for a discussion. But here's the truth. You can disciple anybody else anywhere along the path. I mean, we're called to be salt of the earth, light of the world. We're called to be influencers. And, and, and here's the real truth. Here's the real, here's 24 years of pastoring coming out right here. You know who the people who make the most disciples are? The people who themselves are most interested in being discipled. It's another one of those ironies. Just like the churches that get being sent out are the ones that do better typically of bringing those in. In the same way, the folks that are really like, they really want to be discipled, they tend to do better, whether they call it that or not, at simply discipling, rubbing off, influencing others. Here's the thing. We're called to grow as close as we can to Jesus and as close as we can to someone outside the church. And God takes care of the rest. We grow as close as we can to Jesus and we grow as close as we can to people outside the church. And God takes care of the rest. Within a seven to 10 minute drive of this church, there's about 29,000 people. Um, and what the United Methodist Church has told us is that the average, the average United Methodist Church, what they expect from most Methodist churches is that about 1% of the population within a seven to 10 minute drive is connected with that church. And when I mean connected, it's not that they're necessarily in worship every single week, but these are people that call the church their church home and, in fact, do show up every once in a while. I mean, some people call churches their church home and they never show up, but, but what we're actually talking about is folks that actually do come are connected in some way, some form, some fashion, you know. And so 1% of us being 29,000 people, being within 7 to 10 miles, 7 to 10 minutes, excuse me, um, would be about 290 folks. And th- the good news is we have more than that. In fact, we have somewhere around 400 folks in worship um, each week. Sometimes we have more than that. Sometimes we get close to 500 in worship. Sometimes we're about 350, you know, it vacillates. And, and, and I would say we have, a, we have more than that in worship, right? We, we have somewhere between probably five to 600 total that are connected with our church that call us their church home. Maybe we don't see them but once a month, sometimes it's less than that, but they're connected some way. And so that would put us in the category of what the Methodist Church calls is good. Excellent is 3%, but I want you to just think about what this means for a second. That means one family of three for every 100 people that lives within seven to 10 minutes of the church. Now, now let me stop you right here for a second. Just hold on. Because at about this point, typically about half of us disconnect because we just start talking numbers. And let me, let me just clarify. If all we're going to do is talk about numbers, and all this is is about us becoming some kind of bigger church and a pastor's ego or a church's ego, well, I'm, I'm not interested in talking anymore. 
But if what we're talking about is the compassion of Jesus Christ, if what we're talking about is people that are broken and hurting and they need hope and they need something else than what's in their life, and most of them, by the way, right now, are pretty sure that church is the last place that they'll find it. If we're going to talk about those folks, well, then I'm all in. I'm all in. And I would love for us to talk about 3% of those folks. I'd love to talk about what it would look like for us to be an exceptional church of engaging 870 folks roughly within 7 to 10 minutes from this church. Why? Because Jesus called us to be salt of the earth and light of the world. He said we would be like a city on a hill that can't be hidden. And, and, and listen, folks, making disciples is messy, hard, frustrating, draining, beautiful, incredible, amazing work. I've done it a long time. And the thing is, I'm continuing to be discipled, just like I, I shared earlier. I'm being pushed and shoved and grown and all this kind of stuff. But what I'll... I, here, when we're talking about real people, not just numbers, we're talking about folks that they're hard to get along with at times, like us, but if they don't have the grace of Jesus, it's even worse. When they're really, they're, they're past being critical, some of them are deeply cynical, and it's going to take us growing in Christ and growing together in order to reach them. And I'm going to invite you to take that more seriously wherever you've taken it before, to take it even more seriously now. I'm going to invite you to consider what it might be like for one day somebody or maybe many people to say of you, you presented to me something deep and profound. For those reasons and so many more, I found myself really wanting what you had. I want to tell you I'm grateful beyond words for how you demonstrated to me what it really means to follow him. I believe in you, and I believe by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can go from this place, carry the name of Jesus, and represent him as soul of the earth and light of the world, a city on a hill, for the people who are desperate to need it, who are desperate to need it, and often, often feel like church is the last place they'll find it. Nonetheless, may we go in the name of Jesus for his glory, for their sake and ours. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this, this message that we need to hear. We, we admit to you uh, that as we come to church, uh, often we come as um, sin-sick sinners or, you know, our, ourselves. I mean, we come here broken. We come here needing more hope. Uh, we come here run down and, and burn out and frustrated. We come, that, we come here needing um, picked up and affirmed and encouraged and and, and we just admit that. And we, we confess it and, and we receive your grace, knowing that there's nothing wrong with it, that that's what your church is for. And yet, Lord, somehow in the same sense, even as we who are being healed ourselves and given hope and being shown the grace and mercy of you, Jesus, somehow, Lord, compel us by that same Holy Spirit to do that for others and to welcome others into the fellowship that we are finding, the truth that would lead to the answers they've been seeking. Help us, oh God. Fill us up. Help us to grow as close as we can to you and then show us people in our lives where we need to grow close to. And just so that you can use us, shine your light through us. Provide the goodness, the preservatives, the life-needing ingredients that might influence and affect theirs. Lord, do this for your glory, for their sake, and for ours. In Jesus' name.